you have, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to pick up in verse 17. Verse 17, here the Bible says, recompense, what does recompense mean in the old end? Repay. Reco recompense or repay to no man evil for evil. Who in here has had evil done to him? Purposely. How tempted were you to respond back in kind? Or the same way? Real easy, isn't it, JV? Okay, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stay in line with the lesson first. Then I'll take all questions. Has anybody ever been tempted to respond back the same way they responded to you? And what I try to tell people, that's easy. That's so easy. I had a, a, a buddy of mine that's one of my best friends to this day, who was not a Christian, but he saw me do that and said. You know, people, it was harder what you did than what people were trying to do to you. This is an unsaved person who saw that. So it should be easier for us as Christians if we tie into the scripture. I remember a person asked me, they said, let's see, and I'll come right to you, Sister Juan. They said, well, how, how was it? E I didn't say it was easy. I said it's easier. But it's easier if before we do anything, I mean anything, channel it through scripture. Ask yourself, is there a scripture that covers this? And with today's concordances, encyclopedic indexes, you can look up a word and it'll give you the scriptures for it. But we have to be committed to doing that. Because <laughs> life is easy. This, on this side of life will condition you to somebody curse you so many times, it's going to boil up in you. Sister Wanda, question. Watch this, and there's there's another piece to that. Why else should it be easier for us? Give me give me some specific, Daryl. I was, I was thinking uh, why it should be is, is that we leave room for God to uh, to, uh, to take revenge mm -hmm. because we know that his way is, is thorough. Mm -hmm. if, if we leave it up to ourselves, we tend to take it too far. As Paul Harvey said, we don't know the whole story. Have you ever seen a, a group of dogs walk through a neighborhood? And it seems like the one up front, the smallest one, is always ah, the one that's acting like he can be, he can take out anything. Why do you think he's doing that? Because <laughs> he knows those big dogs behind him got his back. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. Who is that talking about? The Lord, our Lord. Let's make it personal. The reason why we, we shouldn't have to worry about providing evil for evil is because God's got our back. But see, many times we want vengeance to come on this side of town. Get them, God. Like, you know, sick them like a dog. No, it, it, it may not come to them till the afterlife. Bottom line, do we trust God to handle it? Because he's the only one that can see the end from the beginning whenever he wants to. All we can see is what's going on right now. I was talking to a psychologist who's a Christian, and he's just a, just a great guy. He says, you know why it's so important to listen? He says, we should do more listening than talking. Of course, the scriptures say that. He says, but when somebody's talking to you and then you're constantly trying to jump in because you think you're right, what kind of effect? You, you're worried about what's what's going on with you. What kind of effect do you think is going to have with them? They're automatically going to think, well, he, he, he or she don't care what I think about. So it's going to make them want to come at you even more. He says, we as Christians should take responsibility for that. That shouldn't be named among us. If you're having a dialogue, a dialogue requires two people. You may think you're right, but you don't know the whole piece. There may be a part that's not there. 
I think I told you all when I first came down to South Florida, I had a hard time with this drive. Ooh, people come right up beside you and cut over and then hit their brakes. Like, what is that? And that used to get to me. And then one day I thought, I said, I was listening to, I listened to NPR and a lady said, yeah, this guy pulled me out of the car and beat me up. And I was like, man, what happened? Because I cut him off. But I was trying to tell him as he was swinging on me that my husband had had a stroke and I was trying to rush. I was wrong, but I was trying to rush. Do you think that would have made a difference? There's a, Chantel, did you have your hand up? Oh, I'm sorry. There's a popular motivational speaker that said when he went to New York, he was on the subway. And this lady got on the, the subway with her three kids and they were just all over there. He was looking like, oh, come on, well, I'm going to handle these kids. What's going on? What's going on? And then it got to him. He said, ma'am, can't you so just settle your kids down? She says, I'm so sorry. I'll do my best. We just got news that both my mother and my husband was involved in a car accident. It doesn't look like neither one of them are going to make it. I was just trying to give them some space. He said they let them kids run all up and down after the accident because they had the full story. Who's the only person in this whole world that can get the whole story no matter what? God. And if he says vengeance is his, he also says if anybody messes with us, it'd be better if a milestone was tied around their neck and they're tossed into the water. It's not enough for us to say, let me just be in Christ. God said he'd take care of the rest. We have to believe that, though. Brother Slocum. I, I remember... I can relate, my brother. Yes. Absolutely. I'm so glad you hit thoughts. Remember how the book of uh, Romans 12 starts off with the first two verses is talking about? It's talking about renewing our what? Mind. Because we, we, we don't have actions that just happen. Actions start as thoughts. <laughs> and then thoughts develop and then we act on them. Gail and I worked in juvenile justice for years. I used to love talking to the kids. Well, what happened? I caught a charge. And they say they caught a charge like they caught a cold. I said, no, you, you didn't catch no charge. You did something wrong. Well, it was a bad, uh, it was a mistake. No, it was a mistake. You made a bad choice. Because we wanted to get them to come to grips with, you made a choice to do this. <laughs> and as Christians, we have to be careful with the choices that we make. We have to run them through the Bible. That's why Romans, I'll read Romans 12 and 1, uh, specifically verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice it didn't say renew your mind. It says by the renewing of your mind. That's a constant process. Because just before you know it, Somebody will get in your face and, will pray, and as the people say, may get on. I don't know what last nerve really means, but I know it means you're, you, you're mad. You know, I love my mom has a quote that she used to say to me all the time whenever somebody would try to drive her crazy. She says, she used to call me Ricky. She says, Ricky, I will never let anybody deprive me of the right to drive myself crazy. <laughs> That person, nobody else going to drive me. If I go crazy, it's going to be because I chose to go crazy. And I like the, 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 the stance. In other words, nothing should get to you, especially if you're channeling it through the scripture. And you may not know. I don't know what scripture applies to this. That's why you get on the phone or get into Bible study or do it once you get to a point where you can do your own study, then do it. 
But whatever gets to you the most, you should have a scripture. And I got a surprise for you. There's a verse that covers all of them. You all should know it by now. Who knows where I'm going? Daryl. That's it. That covers no matter whatever you go through, you can apply that. That's the catch all. I had a list of them and I took them all away for that. Because it's so powerful. God has given that to us. If God expected us to make it on this side of life without the Bible, why would he give it to us? What would be the need for faith if we could just overcome stuff on our own? We have to use faith. JV, you had your hand up, but I don't want to overlook that. What we're talking about, I believe you mentioned this last Sunday, but uh, once again, I want to reemphasize that it's important. Somebody who is a member of the civic tribe, mm -hmm. somebody who has a background or in the martial arts, or somebody like yourself, mm -hmm. who is a U.S. Marine, and you know every U.S. Marine is trained, trained to fight. On our combat, pay the way you don't believe it, but does that imply no self defense? Well, you. I don't know exactly what the word is, but it's a attempt to bring it to your house. No, 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 it's a, it's a great question. And speaking of Marine Corps, it's the word is repelled. It, it, you, you're talking about the Marine Corps and hand-to-hand. -hand, the word is repel, R-E-P-E-L. And what I love about that, it has the same origin as the Koine Greek word for it. It's somebody coming at you to do you seriously bodily harm. You can repel that. The word trespass, you know, there are many words for sin. One of the words is trespass. It has the same origin as in the law when you trespass on people's property. If you trespass on my house, you're trying to hurt my wife you're probably going to get hurt because you've overstepped. Now I'm defending what belongs to me. You follow me? The context of turn the other cheek, it had to do with when the soldiers came in, you were supposed to help them out because they, they were paid low wages. They needed a place to sleep. You're supposed to let them have your bed. You're supposed to let them have your, your coat and your cloak. If they, if they said, I got to walk two, you said, you walk two, two more with them. That's just going the extra mile. It doesn't mean we become a, a just a, 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 a beaten bag for somebody that wants to take advantage of them. That's not the context of it. Did I answer your question? Yes. yes. And his boss grabbed that hammer and told him, you speak to me another word about your first piece and about throw this hammer at your head. In that case, it will be your... No, but the, but the scripture tells us when that happens, what are we supposed to do? Kick the dirt off our feet. If they're saying, don't talk to me anymore about it, then you have no right to keep going. That's so, right. Even if you want to speak to him, it will be incorrect for him. Strike that in that scenario. Well, no, he can he could defend himself from getting hit, but then because if he chose to continue on, he's adding the fire to the flame when he should just walk away. But if he swings the hammer, he has a right to defend himself, but he needs to get out of there because he chose to go for it and the guy said not. Nah. Make sense? Thank you for the question. Any other questions or comments before we continue? Let's keep going. Says we said recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight. What's that word there? Did it say save men? It said all men. All men. That's why I'm glad JV used that example of a boss who obviously didn't want to hear the gospel. If he's telling you, get out, I don't want to hear the gospel. If you do it again, I'm gonna hit you with this hammer. Kick the dust off your feet and stuff off. He doesn't want to hear it. Last thing we want to do is force it down their throat. I think I told you all uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, there was this big thing with abortion and to the point where some Christians wanted to go arm in arm and surround the abortion clinic. And when people walk up, they wouldn't let them go through. Now, I'm not saying we should kill babies, but that was just as wrong. Because no matter what, from Genesis to Revelation, it's free will. What's our job? To teach them what the Bible says, to let them know what the consequences are. Now, we got to back off. Jesus didn't use any force on anybody. 
He taught them the truth and love. And then if you chose to do it, you were good. If you didn't, you were in a different situation. We don't wrap people up and push them to the side and all this. I think I, I told you all what I told one time. He says, well, brother. He kept emphasizing brother like I was, like, like I was wrong. He's like, well, what are we supposed to do? What's going to happen to those babies? I said, what are the three categories of the Bible? He said, it's only saved and saved. I mean, yeah, saved and unsaved. I say there's a safe category, too. Babies aren't old enough and mature enough to be baptized, so they're safe until they come to the age of understanding. So many, many times we try to do God's job because we think it's right. We got to let the scripture talk. Does that make sense? But that requires for us to know it and be able to tell people to try to force us in these corners. Was your, your hand up, Sister Lopez? Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, that's all you can give, live peaceably with all men. Going back to JV's example, and that man said, if you preach unto me anymore of this Jesus stuff, I'm going to hit you with this hammer. Okay, he's made it clear he doesn't want to hear. We got to be peace. The Beatitude is all about being peacemaker. We could take it to somebody else who may want it. And you know, I, I'm going to share this story again because I've shared it with you all many times before. But sometimes it's easy to prejudge somebody. <laughs> it's like, no, they don't want to hear it. I tell you all about the guy that was part of a, when, when we were growing up, they called them Hell's Angels. And all it was was people, they wore pretty tore clothes and they rode these big old bikes. And I was walking in Santa Monica to see my uncle. So I had my sea bag with my clothes on, on one hand. Every time I moved over, he would move. And I'm thinking, oh, here I'm in a new city and this guy going to start something. And I had to go straight because I couldn't turn around and go back. So I had just got off the, 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 the Amtrak. So I just, in case the worst happened, I switched hands in case he was going to swing or something. So I'd be prepared. And he, he was a big old dude. So I was obviously going to go low. And I had to think that way just in case. And I didn't think I had a shirt on that said Church of Christ. And it had, it says bench press this, no pain, no gain. And I kept wondering why it was looking like that. He was trying to read my shirt. And then when it got to the Church of Christ and when he got up beside me, I'm so glad. Because if it would have been a second later, I probably would have put my fist up. Because he was talking, he came down like this. And I dropped the sea bag and he hugged me and said, my brother. And I still was a little uneasy. He was like, what church of Christ do you go to? And when you ask it like that, you know there's some real to I, I said, uh, uh, what's the Oakland Church of Christ? He was like, oh, that's up north. He was like, I have a group of people. We have Bible study. It's one's going on tonight. Would you come? I said, yeah. I got on the back of that chopper, folks. It sounded good at first. When I got on the back, and he was holding my seat back. When I got on the back, I said, he could be taking me to a place where they're going to slaughter. It could be white nationalists. I'm almost done. And then he, they drove in, and we drove in. They all stood up. And they all had Bibles. We had a good old Bible study from the book of Joshua, which was my favorite book at the time. And I was blown away. I said, if I would have just made a move on what I thought, I would have turned back around and left. And now I had a chance to encourage some Christians that didn't look like me. But they were on the outside. But they were Christians nonetheless. We have to be prepared for something like that. How do you think the disciples felt when Saul became a part of it? It's a man who was persecuting the church. But do we trust God enough to move when he moves? Yes, J.B. Yeah, he was, to the best of his appearance, he looked like a Caucasian. But ultimately, he was a Christian. Yeah, well, I told you, man, he had the Hell's Angel look. And the Hell's Angel look didn't have a good reputation. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, because he looked like a Hell's Angel. Hell's Angels, they came in all different creeds and colors. It's just, and when a person is moving while you're moving and they're big and you don't know, it's like, and I'm trained to recognize stuff like that. I was like, every time I move right, he moves right. Move left, he moves left. 
let me switch to sea bagel. Because I couldn't go get back on the train. So, but thank God it worked out a beautiful experience. Polar opposite of what I thought could have happened. Now, I'm not saying just hop in the car with anybody. That's not the message of what I'm saying here. I'm just saying never underestimate the power of God. Never say, well, this is going on. I don't think nothing going to happen. How can you say that? God has worked miracles with many people. Rahab, Daniel being the lion's den, uh, 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 Saul, uh, Paul, and Silas in the innermost part of the jail. Those are some major movements because those, those men and women stayed, they saw God. Thank you, JB. Bible says, verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. What does that mean? What's funny, it means the same thing in English as it does in the Greek. What does avenge not yourselves mean? Do not seek revenge for the Lord. Well, yeah, don't seek revenge. But so I've heard people on, on these televangelists say that it, it, it talks about, well, and they, they make it ambiguous. They're like, well, there's nothing you can do. It's like they leave you hopeless. That's not what this avenge not yourself is talking about. It actually has to do with the mentality. It, it means simply to not be overly concerned with your safety. Is that saying you shouldn't be concerned about your safety? Yes, you can, but not overly concerned. When I worked for a company called GPS, they sent me up to a training near Okeechobee. And the GPS was taking me through a lot of neighborhoods I wasn't, I wasn't happy with. I wasn't comfortable with, let me be clear. I turned here, three big old rebel flags. Then I look up, and they're all down the street. So who do you think I was going to ask, where's uh, facility ABC? <laughs> they could have they said, yeah, it's right around the corner. Turn around the corner, right next to the Lynch Road. But I, ha I had to keep driving. And all I did was pray and I kept driving. And I finally found my location. Now, that's not saying any of those people were, were low down. I'm not saying that. It's just the impression that they were sending such a strong message to a person who was like, wow. But this says we're not to be overly concerned. Remember what the Bible, the Bible used the term, it uses the term reasonable a lot. The Bible uses the term content not a lot. That's why when people say, I'm not doing too well, I'll say, how's your soul though? Oh no, I'm doing well, well. We should define ourselves by the stage status of our, our soul. Because living on this side of life, we always going to face something that's awful. I've had jobs that started off being great and turned out to be, man, was this the devil in disguise? That bad. But I, I can't sit back and just be overly, overly concerned. Now I'm in the best teaching job I've ever had. And it came real quick, right on time, just everything. So you just, and that's not due to my goodness. It's just how good God is. But we shouldn't be overly concerned. You know the scripture that says, and I've learned therewith to be content. Many times we use the polar opposite by saying, you know, sometimes you can be down. down. That goes both ways. Sometimes things can come so good, so good, you may think, man, something's down to happen. We still have to keep the state of mind to therewith to be content. Is there a disadvantage to always having good things happening to you? That's right. It can mess with your mentality thinking, oh, I'm comfortable then. Then right out of 100 good things, the 101 is bad. You're been out of shape. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I know what the Bible says, but this is hard. We start talking like that because we've, we've gotten so comfortable. And then the flip side, what if we, have we ever, should we always have down or negative things happen? Not at all as, as well, because that can keep us, we can live far lower than Christianity provides for us. It'll get to the point where we might, might not even be able to see Christ. What it takes is a combination of both. That's what gets us to a status of there would to be content. I heard a preacher say one time, we need mountaintop experiences and we need valley. They work together. 
We don't need an abundance. Of course, we want a lot of good stuff. I, I remember one person said, but I, Brother Nelson, I hear what you're saying, but try me with a, with a mountaintop every day. I'll be fine. That's easy to say. That's like saying, I'm, I, you know, I can do anything. And you're right here in Bible study. You show up to work tomorrow and get cursed out, and you're like, boy, you're getting on my last minute. The reality is when you get in the game, it's a little different. Questions, comments, quickly. Gail, yes. That's right. That's right. I like that phrase too. We can stunt our own progress. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a saying. People say, I heard this that not even the all the water from the ocean is gonna sink a ship unless the water gets in. <laughs> yes, okay. that's a great one too. Not all the negativity of the world gonna get you unless you allow it. Allow it to get in. That's exactly right. The one of the uh uh first ladies that I'm I was excited about when I read her biography, her name was Eleanor Roosevelt. And I mean boy, she she did some and this is back during uh when it was uh, uh civil rights. And a lot of stuff she did went totally against what was going on in the land. That's why I respect her a lot. And one day she had met this young African-American boy, and she said, can you read that? And he read it, boom, 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 real, real well. She says, you see how you did that? Somebody taught you that, didn't you? She says, yeah, my daddy. I mean, he said, yeah, my daddy. She says, son, I want you to remember this because you've shown that you're smart. Nobody can make you feel inferior unless you allow them access. In other words, if he lets the world during that time on a lot of races, if he let that get get to him and, and he feels down, you can't blame anybody but yourself because you let it in. No different than what Brother Miguel said about Christianity. We're king's kids. We're a holy nation. How bad can life really be? I went through and I listed a lot of stuff. I'm going to bring it one day. You know, it's a blessing that we're covered in Christ's blood, right? Do you know his blood still flows when we mess up? That's still, I can never, that blows my mind. That's telling me he wants me to make it. So how could I think of myself so low or let anybody pull me down where his blood can't touch me? Thanks for the feedback, Miguel and Gail. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place. Unto wrath. We're going to talk about that for a little bit. For it is written, here it is, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, what does it mean, give, give place to wrath? If somebody's got a gun, say, don't preach the gospel to me. Bro. I'm sorry, I got it. You need to hear this. You take one step forward, I'm shooting you. John 3.16, pow, pow, pow. How should that should have happened? Or what should have happened? When that says give place to wrath, that's not what that's talking about. It does require us being able to handle some persecution. Because they persecuted Jesus. But it does still mean, looking at the earlier verses, we're supposed to live peaceably with everybody. That doesn't mean compromise beyond your Christian values. But if somebody says, get out of my face. Jesus says, kick your dust off and move on. They don't want to hear it. Somebody else will. But can we take a little heat? Can we take what? Can we take uh, heat? I mean, can we take a little challenge or pain? Remember, we're going back to Romans, I mean, Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 1. I beseech ye, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living, what's the next word? What does a sacrifice imply? Say again. Effort, what else? I hear effort, what else? 
Are you putting your cares to the side for the purpose of somebody else? Mm -hmm. Usually. And then there's one final one that we often, we're afraid. Sister Van Cole. Self-denial is a good one. And there's one we're avoiding. Pain. A sacrifice as, as part of the equation requires pain. Even in the Old Testament, when they sacrificed the animals, what did they do to the animals? They killed them. So there was some pain on the animal part. So sacrifice and for our daily sacrifices, it requires pain. What does the pain Im Im imply here? Endurance. I'm glad you said endurance. That is the perfect word. Remember where it says Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him? Does that mean it was easy? He didn't feel anything? No, it implied there was some a lot of pain. But his focus was on the prize that was us, so he did it. That should be our process all the time. Being a Christian is, is going to involve some pain. And there's usually pain to the flesh. But when, it, when it's uh, on God for us, it's always going to help the soul if we allow it. If we get so caught up in the pain of the flesh and like, I don't know why I'm going through this. You know, what's, what's going on? All we're doing is prolonging the pain. Remember when Job's friends came to him? They didn't do him. And you know what was unique about Job's pain? He had emotional pain. He had spiritual pain. He had physical pain. And he had emotional pain all at once. And he wasn't Jesus. Yeah, that's where the emotion comes from. When the, the, the lady that you love the most says, why don't you curse God and die? And he didn't say, I'm divorcing you. He didn't say that. Or he didn't say, you're foolish. He said, you speak of as a foolish woman. In other words, don't put yourself in that category. That's not you. In the midst of pain, he said that. Powerful. Just like, remember our brother Stephen, what he said? It was stoning him to death. But they know not what they do. Where does that kind of strength come from? Connection with God. And it's still possible if we tie in that much. And you guys know I go to the three Hebrew boys all the time because that's the kind of faith I want. Just uh, if I'm getting, getting in a, a fire, has got to be a bad way to go, isn't it? Just get burned up. But they say, God's going to take care of us even if he doesn't. We're still not going to bow down before you, Nebuchadnezzar. They were content in knowing that we're in the hand of God. Whatever he has in store, I'm fine. That's the faith I'm working on. Because that's beautiful. I remember hearing a story. And I'm assuming it's true. They had it on the news. And I was shocked because it was about a guy who claimed to be a Christian. He was on a plane that was going down. And they knew they were going down hard, too. And it wasn't on water. He got up and went and tried to pray with as many people as he could. And they're like, why don't you sit down? You, you go be. He's like, I'm a Christian. So I don't know what his, I don't know what he believed in, but wasn't that an admirable move? And he was that content in where he was. I wasn't able to see the whole story of who, of who, how many survived. But if you believe you're a Christian, you'll do stuff like that because you never know what the outcome will be. The plane may have been able to maneuver. And land, remember the guy that landed on, I forget his name, landed on the Hudson River? And, and when you, was it uh, Sullivan, Sandy Sullivan? And what, when you, I don't know if you all looked heavy into that, that was an incredible feat to land on the water like that. Everybody walked away from that. What I liked about him, he didn't try to get any, any special um, uh, empowerment. It's just when everybody got off, when he was the last one to get off, when he got off, they all clapped and they said, any, pl any plane you're flying, we want to get on. We're not getting on anybody else's plane. That's the kind of effect he had on. I wish people would have got on the fly to Christ so, and realized that no man could have done that. There was something special going on. On the Hudson River, a big old 757. They say that thing landed, and it's the people that watched it say it was amazing. And they were able to walk off on the, on the uh, 
the wings over and get off that get off that plane. Sometimes you have to count your blessings and know where all good things come from. Is that the first bell? Okay. Let's just do one more. And of course, we covered vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Shouldn't that give us comfort? That's a promise he has for all. That's, I call it, the ultimate big brother. It's hard to play. It's like, you mess, do you, you know who my big brother is? You know, Christ is our big brother. You know that. You know, I, you know how many times you could say that if somebody messes with you? Do you know who my big brother is? Do you know who my big brother is? No, do you know who my brother is? Jesus the Christ. I don't think they'll have a big, powerful comeback on that. Brother Miguel. You don't have to doubt your faith. Mm -hmm. have a That's right. Because, you know, doubt and faith cannot coexist for too long. One's going to erode the other. The one you feed is going to eat away from the other. You got to remember that doubt pulls away from your faith. Faith takes away doubt. That's why we got to get in the habit of using our faith. I have a lesson about David, and it's particularly with David and Goliath, but it goes from before he got to Goliath all the way to after Goliath, how he used faith in every aspect of his life. It was a part of his livelihood. One day, I, I, I did it once, I'll do it again. But it, it still talks to me to this day. He used faith in every aspect of his life since he was a 12-year-old boy. I don't know who of you in here can stand before a, a lion or a bear. And we're Christians. Oh, Barry, you ain't going to do nothing to me. I'm going to protect these sheep. God is my victory. <laughs> you look for the next Uber. You look for the next Uber to come by. He was 12. And I like to tell people, when it came to watching the flock, that was considered the low-end low job. But he did it because he was doing it as unto the Lord. Lord allowed him to take out a, a bear. And a lion. So who was Goliath by the time David got to him? Just another person standing in the way of the army of the Lord. Twelve. I could not get enough of that story. Next verse. Verse 20. We'll see if we can finish it. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, notice it said, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. You know why I love that scenario? Because when you're doing that, they're trying to figure out, wait, I just cut you out. I just did this. But yet you're being nice to them and giving them stuff. They're like, ah! Like having heaps of coals on their head. The scenario was perfect. That's what's supposed to be named among us. Because if we don't, we're simply doing what the world will do. We want to be fair to the bell. So, Lord's will, on Sunday, we'll pick up verse 21 and get into chapter 13. Thank you all for your great comments and questions. Bow with me, if you would. Our most gracious and heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Heavenly Father, thanking you for giving us this time, Heavenly Father, just to look into your word. Help us to not only look into it, help us to hold on to it, and most importantly, take it into the world and be those ambassadors for your son, Christ Jesus whom you called us to be. It is in his name, Christ Jesus, we do pray and ask it all. Amen. Hey, Brandon showed us his range tonight. He was just showing off, I guess. Boy, he took us to the bayou, and then he brought us back on up. So, amen, amen. So tonight we wanted to just spend a few minutes on Sunday. Good evening, first of all. Good evening. As we think about the word of God tonight, we want to spend a few minutes on Sunday, we looked at a scripture, and it just, it's a constant reminder, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And we, we talk about perspective. Philippians 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I love some of the discussion tonight in Bible class. I appreciate Brother Rick teaching said class. And what do you allow to get in? What we allow to get in will have an effect. As a matter of fact, that's why I call it infection. It's inside of you. You know, you can feel, you can kind of tell if you got something 
something's not normal in your body, you know, you got a cold coming on and that's going around too. So if y'all, some of y'all feeling the way you're feeling tonight, we'll see y'all the next scheduled assembly, the next after, the one after the next. I'm just sorry. But let me move on. Uh, infection, a germ. A uh, seed grows from the inside out. And so when you think about the basic chemical reaction, the natural process. And so the same Paul who wrote the epistle, the letter to the Church of Christ at Philippi, encourages us tonight. And I want to spend the rest of our time in Philippians chapter four. Because when we allow the peace of God, when we allow our faith to be cultivated, and we talk about cultivation, something you're going to be, you'll hear me say a lot in the days to come because you know, the Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 17, so then faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, we oftentimes use that only in a moment like this, the Lord's invitation. Does that mean the only time our faith can be cultivated is when we first hear the word of God, when we first hear the gospel and we are saved? No, that's an ongoing process. It's the present participle. So then faith cometh by hearing. That's an ongoing process. Every time we hear God's word, it should stir something up in us. Amen. It should move us. It should have an impact on us. Every time we hear God's word, our faith can be increased. Our faith can be cultivated. See, when I do my hands like this, cultivation, it's like turning over the dirt. You turn over the dirt, you know, and then under, underneath, Brother Dowdell, that dirt gets a little darker. It's a little richer. And so our faith has to be cultivated, saints. And so sometimes people let it sit. You ever, and I don't have a green thumb by any stretch, but I understand and I know a little bit about it. When that dirt gets a little, you know, it needs some water and you just let it sit and it starts to get dry. Saints of God, I'm, I firmly believe that a lot of saints of God, our faith has gotten a little, needs some cultivation. Needs some cultivation. So that's why Bible study is important. That's why fellowship is important. Iron sharpens iron. And so as you think about just tonight, let me just kind of come down. to I see the runway, but I'm trying to land the plane here. So here's, here's our point tonight. What's infecting us? I don't mean that in the context of negativity. I hope not. We are susceptible in the flesh to germs and things impacting our physical body. But tonight I'm talking about our soul. I'm talking about the spiritual man. I'm talking about as Christians. Have you heard the phrase garbage in? Garbage out. If you had a steady diet of just junk food, you probably would not be the healthiest person in the physical context. So as we as we continually feast on God's word, Philippians chapter four, the Bible says, within this is what this can be the result, can be the result. Rejoice in the Lord. Philippians four and four. Rejoice in the Lord always. How often should we rejoice, saints? Uh, so if we're cultivating our faith, this is what it should look like. So you show me a child of God and, you know, I was joking with Brandon because you know, we're the LSU brothers tonight. But I'm joking with Brandon about being as deep as the bayou. And then we got those valley experiences. And then we got the we got the top mountaintop and valley. Some children of God, our mindset goes right to the valley. Can we celebrate something? I've told many a person this in a business context. I'm around a lot of very, very competitive business people every single day. And some some people that have been around for 20 plus years. You can have the best um, meeting and all that. They still going to find something wrong. And I've said many times, I said, can we just take, can we take a second to celebrate this? Well, we could have maybe raised more money. Can we celebrate this? And say to God, don't be that Debbie Downer. I got to think of it. Or Don Down, male or female, whatever. Don't be that naysayer. There's always something wrong. Can't you celebrate? Rejoice the Lord. The Bible doesn't say rejoice when you feel like it. This is a mindset. Re so you mean to tell me in the midst of pain, I'm going to rejoice? Lord, thank you for allowing me to be in my right mind so I can tell somebody about this pain. And they, they, maybe when they co go through a similar experience, I can be an encouragement to them. Amen. Some people, it's always something. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Paul repeats it, rejoice. So saints, what should we do if this mind is in us? Rejoice. Rejoice. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he felt pain. What did he say? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. He still had the mentality to focus on what pleases the Father. He still had the mentality of, what, of doing the Father's will. So one, we rejoice. Let's take it down a few verses. Let your moderation, translate that word, preacher, let your gentleness. 
If we, if we pick up these words, this is a precursor to Sunday's lesson. Let your moderation, let your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The day of his coming, his second coming. We don't know the day nor the hour. It's going to be like a thief in the night, but it's nearer than when we first believed. Let your gentleness be known unto all men. I love Rick's example until he got onto that motorcycle in the back. I didn't know about that motorcycle party. I would have been on Zoom for that first one. Okay, you I'll join your Bible study. We'll see how it looks. But nevertheless, <laughs> gentleness. Let people see our Christ-likeness. Let people see our love. Let your gentleness be known unto all men. Christ, not only did he extend his grace, but his mercy. Can we be merciful? So as children of God, as we let this mind be in you, we rejoice always. We recognize the, Lord's, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Practical things we can do. Point number three, we recognize let our gentleness be known unto all men. People need to see it. We don't always, we don't always have to be harsh. Let your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. But here's our last one. Two more verses, rather. Be careful for nothing. So now here's what this requires some restraint. And this requires some perspective. Translate the word careful. Be anxious in nothing. I wonder if, I'm not going to ask the question. I'll ask it, but you don't have to answer out loud. Because I already know the answer. When we think about anxiety, you translate that word careful. Be anxious for nothing. There's a phrase, uh, you know, a term just cool under pressure, calm under pressure. Saints of God, we shouldn't be the one that's worrying about everything. But yet, yet it happens in the Lord's church. So if we rejoice always, we recognize the Lord is near. People see, let all mankind see our gentleness, because that also includes strength. But then also don't be anxious in anything. So what should we do? If there's something beyond our control, what should we do? Worry about it? If there's something beyond our control, something you know you can't change, you know you can't even, maybe you can just be positive, you can have an indirect effect, but I can't control Miguel, I can't control Rick, but I can be gentle. I can let my brother see my gentleness. But look what the Bible says, Philippians 4, verse 6, but in every, so be, don't be anxious in anything, but in everything. Look at this masterful teaching. Again, be, don't be anxious in anything, but in everything, that for nothing, King James Version, don't be anxious in anything. I'm going to be just as cool as I need to be in any situation. Oh, there's things that can be scary. There's things that can be, that can cause kind of that blood pressure to go up. There's things that can maybe trigger some emotion, but we got to keep, we got to have some restraint as children of God. Amen, saints. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, there we go. We can always pray and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto your best friend. Somebody, somebody, a co-worker. Oh, you, we, need to, we need to pray to the Lord. We need to pray. This allows us to cultivate our faith. Turn that dirt over so the plant can grow and be nourished. And when we do this, here it is, verse 7. And the peace of God, peace, absence of hostility, absence of, uh, of conflict. That doesn't mean conflict doesn't exist in the world, but we can have peace in our mind. We could be at peace. See, people, they ask me this question all, I was just recently interviewed, and somebody asked me the question, they ask me these all the time, leadership questions. What keeps you up at night? I said, I'm going to change that question. I said, what drives me is this. You see, that people, that the world wants us, what keeps you up at night? Nothing. I used to think of ways. Well, what keeps them up at night? Uh, what if a, an all the employees walk out? Well, they will all be unemployed. That's going to keep me up at night. They are out of a job. See, people, that's what the world does to us. What keeps you up? And again, you, you stick around long enough, be in leadership. Someone's going to ask you that question. It's one of the top leadership questions. What keeps leaders up at night? And I'm going to do everything I can. What drives me every day is to make it to heaven. What drives me is how can I make somebody better? See how you flip that? And so as we close in the peace of God, look at what the Bible says, which passeth all understanding. The Messianic prophet Isaiah made it very clear. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord, neither your ways, my ways, the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways and your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Quit trying to outthink God. Quit trying to control other people and just take a deep breath 
and turn over the dirt. Cultivate our faith. Because when we have this peace, it shall keep your hearts and minds. That word keep shall guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So my friends, tonight, I pray to God that we cannot allow our faith to just get stale. Every time the word of God is preached, every time the word of God is taught, may it do something to our hearts. May it prick our hearts so we can be better. What can I do to be a better asset in the kingdom? Let me get rid of these liabilities we talked about. Maybe bad behaviors, unhealthy behaviors. If it's not helping you grow, why are you doing it? If these people are not pushing you to be better as a child of God, why are you around them? And that's your core group. That's your, your peer group. You're going to be around people that are not children of God. We recognize that we're in the world, but not of the world. So tonight, the, the encouragement is this. Thank God for his the gift on the cross, his death on the cross, his long suffering on the cross. And so if you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, and for those that maybe listen to this either tonight or at some point in the future online, do you trust God to save your soul? The plan of salvation will not change. We need to change. In finance, you got fixed and variable. Fixed means it stays the same. Variable means it changes. It's amazing how mankind is trying to make the God's plan of salvation a variable thing. You ask God to come into your heart. You just send us a donation. We're going to pray for you and you're saved. No. Brothers and sisters, we need to, and we are understand as those who have obeyed the gospel. God's simple plan of salvation must hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of the, that's what the gospel means. The facts of the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection. How that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. You must hear and believe that. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Once you hear and believe the gospel, you're willing to repent of your sins. Luke three, Luke chapter uh, 13, verses three and five. Jesus says, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Having changed our mind again, having been having that word have an effect on us, then it works on us. But we make a conscious decision. See, God doesn't seek to control us. That's why it's called faith. We make a decision. To obey the gospel, having confessed Jesus Christ to be the son of God, Acts 8, 37, Matthew 10, 32, you're immersed in water and baptism washes away all our sins. We become a child of God and we rise up to walk, to live, rejoicing always. Let not gentleness be known to all men, recognize the Lord is near and keeping a peace of mind, not being anxious, but be peaceful. That allows us to show that restraint that Brother Rick was talking about. When someone says, you say one more thing about Jesus, I'm going to hit you with a hammer. Well, to, did we show that restraint? And then guess what? They may sit at home to, that night and think about he could have easily responded, but he chose not to. And that may prompt another opportunity for you to teach him the gospel. We're in the world, saints, but not of the world. May God bless you tonight. And I pray to God that somebody is here tonight that recognizes the price has already been paid. That's why the Bible says there's a the song songwriter report. There's a fountain free. Tis for you and me. The price was paid at the cross of Calvary. If you're here tonight. Uh, won't you come as we together stand and as we together sing the song of encouragement? Won't you come? There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste, to its bring. Tis the fount of love from the source above. And he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis the fountain Open for